Once again, we welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome a new voice to the program this week. Tyler Duvalius uh, joins us now. And uh, Tyler, I know you're checking in from Columbus, Ohio, but tell us just a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do. Brian, thanks so much for, for having me. I'm the Director of External Affairs for an organization called the Conservative Energy Network. We are a national organization with state-based affiliates in 21 different states across the country. Um, and all of our state affiliates share a message of wanting to forge a clean energy future that's rooted in conservative principles. So excited to be on today and, and talk about conservative energy. Well, we're definitely taking some very bold steps towards clean energy. And uh, the, the problem is, um, at least under, under the Biden administration, it seems like a lot of those steps are almost a headlong rush into clean energy, uh, which in itself isn't a bad thing. But uh, when it starts to impact your standard of living. I'm looking at Europe in particular, you know, just if you want to see people whose heating bills have gone from 250 bucks to 2,500 bucks or the equivalent, that is a problem. Talk to me about how we can be concerned about the, the environment, we can be concerned about the climate, but those concerns can also be addressed closer to home than wherever the centralized government is. No, you're, you're exactly right. I think what Democrats are, are creating is a, a blue demand, and they're relying on, quite frankly, supply from, from red states to, to solve this issue. And they're wanting to skip over um, the reliability aspect of energy. And, and that's where I think conservatives can really come in as we talk about an all of the above energy portfolio, um, something that's inclusive of, of traditional sources of energy here at home, such as coal, natural gas. Um, that are, are when we make them in America, they are cheaper and cleaner and can be used by folks around the world, um, certainly more so than, than what goes on in Europe. Um, and as we think about how do we really maintain and, and achieve energy independence and energy dominance in this country, how can we work in new sources of, of energy? I'm thinking geothermal, um, new nuclear, solar, wind, uh, those types of resources. And, and what we want to see is, is for energy to move in a competitive free market environment um, and not something that's just mandated by our, uh, our government officials in Washington, D.C. And, and that's where a lot of state officials are um, just doing doing great work in in conservative states to to advance the American energy portfolio in a way that is both smart and sustainable. Tyler, it's such a weird place to be right now where if you express hesitation on what well, should we really, you know, be selling off the strategic uh, petroleum reserves or should we really be restricting any kind of exploration or development for, um, you know, fossil fuel sources at this point, um, you're, you're essentially kind of lumped in with, well, or what are you, some kind of climate denier? It seems like there's a very polarized environment. Um, most people I know who would call themselves conservative are very concerned about being good stewards, you know, being taking care of the environment, but they don't want to do it at the expense of, well, we're going to go back to living in caves and washing our clothes on rocks down by the river. Sure. And we shouldn't have to worry about, um, you know, as we're, we approach the Labor Day weekend, it's sort of the traditional end of summer, and we shouldn't have to worry if we're going to have heat in our homes. Like some, unfortunately, some countries in Europe are going to have to worry about, um, you know, when, when we take this in a, a smart, pragmatic way, uh, we, we can both care for the environment and reduce emissions. And you're right, to be conservative is to conserve. We want to conserve the natural world that we have around us and, and protect God's beauty. Um, but that doesn't have to be at the detriment of our economy. It doesn't have to be at the detriment of our national security. Right now, we are seeing uh, more so than ever, particularly in Russia and Ukraine, the importance of energy policy in the geopolitical sphere. Um, and also, one of the, the, the greatest things about being an American is our ability to innovate through uh, any issue that, that comes our way. And, and so instead of, of you know, flipping the switch and going right to wind or solar, which admittedly, and I, I like them just as much as anybody, but they're intermittent resources. Yeah. Um, and, and so as we think about what can we do, we, we should be spending research and development dollars towards other baseload um, generation. We can think about things like carbon capture um, and other technologies that exist out there to help us make it a transition. It's not, we're not flipping a light switch on and off. Um, rather, it needs to be a, a true transition towards a cleaner, more sustainable future. Something you mentioned earlier that I'd kind of like to revisit is the idea that there is 
momentum building in the free market. In other words, people are saying, you know what? Clean energy makes sense. And they're working very hard to innovate and develop, you know, wind and solar resources. They're just not there yet. And and, and so government steps in with all these subsidies and that tends to push things forward uh, to where the market really isn't ready yet. I think it's going to be, but it, it needs to happen, do I dare say, organically. <laughs> the market's got to grow to where <laughs> it'll support it. No, absolutely. You know, we do polling um, each and every year. And, and what our polling has found is that uh, Americans, 84 percent of Americans support accelerating our transition towards a clean energy future. But 63 percent of, of those voters want it to be through market based policies. And the fact of the matter is, is when you rely on on a free market, when you rely on market based policies to advance anything, um, that industry is going to be much more sustainable than an industry that's propped up through government mandates and, and bloated subsidies. Give me some examples of, we can start with just like governor level leadership. What are some of the sure. ways that uh, that some of these climate uh, issues and, and clean energy concerns are being addressed at the state level? Sure. So you look at Governor Eric Holcomb from the state of Indiana, a very conservative state. And Governor Holcomb is the, the predecessor or successor of, uh, of Vice President Mike Pence, uh, Republican supermajority in the General Assembly. He signed a litany of bills um, this last General Assembly that touched on everything from nuclear development to um, smart electric vehicle policies in the state of Indiana uh, to, to protecting solar development in the state. And, and when you look at an embrace like that, where the state of Indiana is not just putting their, their eggs in one basket, um, but rather diversifying their portfolio, much like we would with our stock portfolio and our retirement accounts. Uh, when you look at a, a state like that, they're truly embracing what it means to be uh, an all of the above um, energy producer. And, and you can also look at, at a state like Alaska, which is very different, still a very conservative state, but Alaska has its own unique problems, particularly when it comes to reliability. And, and there, Governor Dunleavy, he's, he has set a goal, and not a mandate, but a goal of having 80% renewable energy in the state of Alaska by 2040, which is a laudable goal. Um, but what they're doing is they're, they're allowing themselves a chance to innovate uh, to get to that point so that they're not rushing because it's, Alaska is a state where if there's a bad storm up there, if, if it's very hard to get extra resources. And so they recognize that they need every uh, megawatt of energy that, that they can get. And so those are two states that really jump out as um, areas where they're trying to just do everything they can to produce as much energy and whatever energy they don't need. Here's the beauty about a free market. We can sell it. Uh, right. That's one of the, <laughs> one of the reasons we want... <laughs> Right, exactly. We want as much American-made energy as we can, because all that does is positions our country um, in a much stronger position when it comes to the geopolitical sphere. Well, it seems like a lot of the, the climate uh, drama in Washington, D.C. is just that. It's about jockeying for political power and jockeying for position. Um, I, I really do believe the two sides are probably closer than they think in, in terms of um wanting a clean world, you know, clean water, clean air, you know, um, clean energy. But uh, wow, that sledgehammer approach is sure taking a toll on people right now. What's your prognosis for the near future? P particularly, I'd like to get your take. Europe sounds like it's really backed into a corner. Do you see some tough times on the horizon for them? Unfortunately, I do. And and what Europe did is twofold. They, they took away baseload energy and then decided to rely on Russia to backfill their energy needs going forward in the future. Um, and obviously, with the state of, of the world today, that's, that's going to create a problem for them. Um, I saw a study that in England, uh, a large percentage of their society is, is going to be in energy poverty, where they're spending just exorbitant amounts of their household income on their energy bill uh, come later this winter. And, and that's one of those things where, you know, that's where American made energy can come into play. We should be transporting our excess energy to Europe and we need to be able to position ourselves uh, to, to play that role. You've probably seen the the clip that's been circulating. I, I've just seen this on Twitter, but um, it was uh, President Trump back, I think, in 2018, warning the German leadership, your country is going to be in big trouble if you continue to outsource you know your energy to to russia and they laughed at him and i mean it's i'm i'm not trying to say trump was infallible but wow he kind of knew what he was saying at least in that instance 
he, he was absolutely right in that instance. And, and the kicker is the Keystone pipeline here at home is much cleaner than the Nord Stream pipeline that runs from Russia to Germany is now shut off. So while Democrats here at home shut off jobs and American energy in the Keystone XL pipeline, we enriched and lined Putin's pockets in, in Russia for energy that's no longer even, even in use today. Wow. Wow. Unintended consequences. We're getting quite an education. Yes, exactly. Again, we are talking with Tyler Duvalius. He is the Director of External Affairs for Conservatives for a Clean Energy Future and also a Young Voices contributor. Tyler, uh, tell us where we can follow you on social media, where we can find your writing. Sure. Appreciate it. You can follow me on, on any social media at Tyler Duvillius. I know it's a, a mouthful for a last name, but it's D-U-V-E-L-I-U-S. Um, you can also, you know, follow us online at www.conservatives4energy.org. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome Eugene Ralph Jr. to the program, checking in today from Dallas, Texas. How are you today? Doing very well. Fantastic. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What makes you tick? Well, uh, it's an interesting story here in uh, Dallas, Texas. We're actually a little bit of transplants from New Orleans. So a lot of uh, the kind of things I see going on, I take a, a moment to actually stop and reflect and compare how things are happening here in this great Lone Star State to uh, our home state of Louisiana. So it's very interesting to actually get a, a good look at it. You know, a lot of people have different ideas about how uh, how the, the government will operate, you know, whether or not it's more corrupt in one place or another. And coming from Louisiana, you get the chance to realize that every place is just as corrupt, but some people have a better face on it. Wow, that's very, that's very well put. <laughs> I'd say it's right on on the money. Look, I know there's a lot of discussion right now, changing definitions and everything. Are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? You've got a wonderful piece that you wrote for the Daily Bell that uh, says, yeah, a recession's not only here, but it's it's really it's a necessary thing. So I guess we'll we'll just give this disclaimer. This is not an easy topic for a lot of people because we don't like economic pain. Talk to me about why corrections must happen. Well, absolutely. I thank you for asking that question. Really, whenever we're coming up on this topic of recession, a lot of people really, in the minds of the average person, the recession just means bad times. Uh, but really, in an economic sense, it means that a lot of people have played with the market too much, uh, that banks have gotten involved in all kinds of manipulation and distorted the economy such that people are putting all kinds of investment, heavily leveraged by debt, into things that really shouldn't be getting money at the time. Uh, so really, there's no way to get around it. The capital has to be reallocated into productive uses. And so at some point, people will see the prices of assets falling. And, you know, since everybody's invested in the 401k market, you know, people's uh, retirement start to decline. And it's a very difficult time for a lot of people, but it's absolutely necessary in a way for us to actually get back on something like a stable footing in the economy. I know that, uh, at least from, from the Washington, D.C. side, there's always the, the question of blame. Who can we blame for this? But taking, taking it out of just, hey, who, who can we find to hang the blame on? Um, let's talk about it in terms of responsibility. Um, th- there's an incredible amount of spending taking place at the federal level. Talk to me about central bank policy, particularly the Federal Reserve. How do, do their um, efforts within the economy either... Uh, help or hurt the situation? Well, the, the unfortunate thing is that there's very little that a central bank can actually do to help the economy. Uh, it can do a lot of things to temporarily make it feel like we're having a massive boost. So this is typically what happens when you see a bubble, uh, when you have, say, the housing bubble, where central banks basically force uh, local banks to actually give new loans to people that they might not have given to in order to boost home ownership. So we get lots of housing, price, asset inflation, and then suddenly, you know, that stuff has to correct. 
So really, the central banks are very limited as far as what they can do to help the economy as far as actually positively improving people's circumstances. The best thing that they can do at any given time, especially now, whenever they've driven up the uh, inflationary environment so much, is really to kind of take their hands off and let the thing kind of work itself out. I was hoping your answer would be some variant of stay out of the way. <laughs> That's what they need to do. <laughs> That's about right. But, you know, it seems like... I, I know that, uh, you know, raising and lowering interest rates, you know, look, money's easy to get. Oh, now it's not so easy to get. That definitely has a direct impact on the economy. Um, but in the short term, when, when they contract, you know, the, the issuance of credit, suddenly everything starts to, to get a little bit tougher. Nobody has quite the cushion that they had before, you know, to run a business or start a business for that matter. That's absolutely true. Uh, the, the issue of credit contraction is always very difficult whenever it first starts to come. But really, when we think about it long term, this is always going to be better for us because it's better for an economy to be based more on savings than it is on credit. Uh, it's very difficult in order to actually price the entire market of goods, of services, of assets, whenever everything is essentially based on other people's money. Uh, but you see through the history of economies throughout most of the world, pretty much up until uh, the post-war, World War II period, that economies' growth are based on the savings of people. Uh, and you see that that actually provides us the most stable environment to have massive prosperity for an entire country. Let's dive into that a little bit further, because I'm really happy to hear you say this. I don't think there are that many people out there who grasp savings is is how you build wealth and and they may be thinking well eugene look people got their money sitting in the bank it's just sitting there it's not doing any good help me understand what they're missing when, when they take that approach well in some sense uh the people that say eugene how is it possible for us to save right now they're partially correct uh, in the environment that the central banks have created now, everybody essentially has to be an asset trader in order to make sure that they have money for their posterity. If they intend to actually have some sort of uh, some sort of nest egg available for their children 100 years from now, uh, if they just sit that in the bank, they're absolutely right that they're not going to have any purchasing power by the time it comes for their children's children to actually start accessing that capital. Uh, so it is a very difficult uh, situation to be in, but... Uh, the best thing that anybody can do, perhaps, is to find harder assets to save in. This would include uh, land purchases, uh, even crypto. A lot of people are very bullish on Bitcoin. And I am a Bitcoin maximalist, I would say myself. Uh, but yeah, I think the biggest thing is that they're absolutely right that you can't really save as far as just putting paper money inside of a bank account. Uh, but that's just because paper money doesn't actually have real value. So if you want to save, you have to save in actual assets. That's a great explanation. And I, I'm also thinking, too, of, you know, for those who do have money in the bank, and, and I'm just I'm going to set aside the fact that the money is worth less every month as we go down the road. But the bank puts that money to use. In other words, people who do want to create a business or, you know, uh, to build something, you know, that, that would hold value, they turn to the bank and they take out loans. And I I. It's just, I know it seems counterintuitive, and I think a lot of people in government have the idea, well, if we just get them spending, I, I seem to remember so many stimulus checks in the last 20, 30 years that have come down the road. Well, the economy's faltering. Let's send them a check and get everybody spending. But that isn't, uh, that's just consuming. It's not actually creating something that continues to create wealth. That's absolutely right. And what we have right now in the United States essentially is a consumer economy. Uh, a lot of people have made the, the observation that we just don't have the kind of manufacturing sector that used to exist here. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But it is true that at this point in time, uh, America is essentially a consumer service. It's a consumer and services economy. There's not much else going on. Uh, however, to your point that uh, it's, it's very difficult for people to actually see what it is that they're supposed to be doing in this sort of situation where uh, I can't just put my money in the bank and all I need to be doing is spending the money the bank is going to actually hold on to it and get investment. Yes. Uh, there was a time when banks actually did require other people's money to make investments. <laughs> but with money all essentially being fairy dust and bank credit at this point, while it's true that if everybody took their money out of the bank, if you take your money out of the bank, I guarantee you it's not going to hurt the broader economy. And in fact, you will be doing a great service to you and your fellow man. 
I like where you're coming from. I love it. Again, we're, we're talking with Eugene Ralph, Jr. He's an economic student from Dallas, uh, working in construction management and also a Young Voices contributor. Um, so I'm asking you to prognosticate, but in your best guess, Eugene, um, what kind of what kind of time frame does it take for corrections like this to play out? I know the Great Depression was prolonged because government intervened. If government steps back and keeps its hands off and lets the market correct out with the bad debt, you know, let the, the new opportunities come forward to take its place. Give me a rough estimate. How how long is that going to take? Well, I'll tell you first off that uh, when it comes to economists, we're really great at looking at the past and seeing what happened, but we're notoriously bad at predictions. But I will give <laughs> a, a little bit of a chance to really say, if the government actually just said, we're going to let this thing correct itself, the American people are strong enough to actually make it through this hard times. I could easily see that America is on something like good economic footing within 10 months. It's possible, wow. but I don't think it's likely. Yeah, and, and people who might doubt, I would, I would say, man, you should really check check out about the uh, recession or the was it uh, maybe it was even a depression that happened in the early 1920s, but it cycled through very quickly because government didn't intervene like it did. Well, about ten, year, ten years later, um, tell us. In where, fact, many of the famous. Where can we I find won't. you on social media? I'm sorry, we're up against the clock. Just want to let our listeners know where can they find you, Eugene. Right, uh, so I'll be posting many things on Twitter, and you can find me at E Ralph G R. That's Eugene Ralph Jr., but yeah, just the initial. Uh, so I have made uh, many different takes. Some of it related to economics, some of it related to broader issues in the culture. <laughs> Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Very happy to have you with us as we uh, are joined by our next contributor. We want to welcome uh, Callum Payton to the uh, to the show. And you're checking in today from London. First of all, welcome. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Brian, for having me. All right. So I've told you, I think that you, you have probably the coolest name that I have run across today. <laughs> uh, and so this one's going to stick in my brain. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Callum, and and who you are, what you do, and and then we have an article we'll discuss. Yes, so um, I'm Callum. I'm I'm from London. I um, am a history and politics graduate. I'm now studying uh, law here in London. And um, I sort of, um, whilst I'm studying my law, I do a lot of um, political commentary, um, primarily on UK and US politics. Um, So, yeah. Okay, and I guess there there are some very pivotal elections that are coming in the UK. There are. I know yeah. here in the US, we kind of get hyper-focused on, you know, it's all around <laughs> our own elections and everything. But yeah. in, in the yeah. broader world, there are some very serious um, decisions to be made. And the UK mm. in particular, uh, talk to us. First of all, set the stage. For those who don't know, what is at stake yeah. in the upcoming elections in the UK? Yes, yeah, so... Um we are choosing our next prime minister, essentially. Um, we we have a very different system in the UK than in the US. We don't have a, a president that's directly elected by the people. We have a prime minister who is um, selected by their party. And then whoever has the largest party, that person sort of by convention becomes the prime minister. Um, so what we've got here is that the prime minister um, was forced to resign um, for a series of different controversies. Um, that has then triggered a leadership contest. So that's given a sort of six week process um, where firstly, the the members of parliament for the Conservative Party uh, sort of whittle it down to a final two. They then put that out to the Conservative members of which there I think are about 150,000 um, who then get to decide between those two who becomes the prime minister. And that's all without it going to a, a general election or a, a ballot of the entire country. It's just those 150,000 uh, Conservative Party members that get to choose who that prime minister is. Now, Callum, it, it's always going to be a little bit of a personality contest, but it sounds like yes. right now, uh, Europe in particular has some really serious issues that whoever is, is you know, the next prime minister is going to have to address. Uh, talk to me yeah. about, uh, for instance, energy costs. I, I'm just I'm hearing horror stories coming out. And I, I'm kind of yes. hoping that they're not true, but but my gut tells me they're they're legit. Yeah. So um, in the wake of sort of initially what happened with Ukraine, we saw pretty much around the world energy prices skyrocketed. And I understand that in the US, it's starting to fall again a little bit. But here, 
um, they're continuing to rise. So inflation across the board is now beyond 10%, mostly driven by those energy prices. And then you've got um, the energy price cap, which is essentially the, the maximum am- amount that these energy companies can charge uh, per unit of energy. has also been increased. So now it's predicted that the average household will pay more than three and a half thousand pounds a year just on their energy costs. So that's about 20 percent of the average um, income of anybody. And um, it's expected to rise even further. So there are predictions that inflation could hit 22 percent next year at some point. And also that the energy prices for individual consumers could be over six thousand pounds by sort of January, February time. So, um, yeah, we're in, we're in a bit of a difficult economic situation at the moment. And obviously, this leadership contest is uh, happening right in the middle of it. So um, it makes it difficult to formulate any kind of long-term response to, to the problems that are affecting ordinary households at the moment. What, uh, what differences are there between the, the approaches of the, of the likely candidates to, to be the next prime minister are, are they hmm. are they close at all in their approaches or are they very different so rishi sunak who is um the, the former chancellor he um he is what is considered a thatcherite so you had reagan we had thatcher pursuing a very very similar um style of politics throughout the 1980s style of economics throughout the 1980s Sunak is much more in that sort of camp. Um, He's sort of very prudent. He doesn't want to drastically cut taxes. He doesn't necessarily want to give massive handouts to individuals because he's worried that by doing so, you'll push inflation much higher. He has sort of softened on that a bit and is saying that he will give some um, sort of uh, rebates, I guess, to individuals and some help specifically in relation to their energy bills. But um, it's very different to Liz Truss, who seems to subscribe to a sort of a newer school of thought. Um, It's perhaps an updated version of Keynesian uh, economics, where the actual level of debt that the country is in isn't the main focus. The focus is more um, the impact on the individual. So she's been advocating for more tax cuts throughout, um, throughout this to help individuals with those extra uh, energy prices and has been saying that in order to pay for it, we'll be paying debt back over a much longer period of time. So whereas you've got him as the much more traditional conservative, um, worried about too much debt, she's more of a let's cut the taxes now. We need the help now. We can just pay it back over a long period of time and we'll be OK. Those are the two major differences, because on most Uh, say, cultural issues or social issues, they're very, very aligned. It's just those economic differences that are quite clear. So, Callum, what's the mood of the average Mm. uh, citizen towards this? Can you kind of get a sense of of where public sentiment is? Yeah, so I think that entirely depends um, whether you're a Conservative Party member or not. I think a lot of Conservative Party members... Uh, are quite engaged with the process. I mean, it's always exciting when you're selecting a new prime minister, but even they are um, getting a bit fatigued with the whole process now. And the country as a whole are very much fatigued with this whole process. Um, it started on the 7th of July, uh, 7th of July I believe, is when Boris Johnson resigned. Um, so we've now had almost two months of this leadership contest. Um, everyone in the public generally are thinking, you know, we need to get this over with now. Um, we need someone in place who can implement some policies that are gonna they're gonna help us because Boris Johnson decided that any policies um related to tackling this cost of living crisis should be up to the next prime minister. So there's been relatively little uh done throughout the summer to alleviate these costs. And um, so obviously there are many people in the country right now that are struggling to pay their bills, to heat their houses, um, especially worrying as we head into the winter. And so um, the general mood, I think, is let's let's get it done with. Let's get a prime minister in place and let's get some policies implemented that are going to help us as we move into the winter. Wow. I am. On the on the one hand, you know, I I can I can feel for the people who are going. Come on, we're dragging our feet. Let's get this over with. On the other hand, what a 
what a challenge to have to face. I, I saw yeah. an image somebody had posted on, I think it was on Twitter, a small coffee shop got their, mm. um, their heating and cooling bill, basically their utilities bill. And it yeah. was, it was like 9,000 pounds. It was insane yeah, for, for a month. I've seen others as well that are um, just crazy high. I've seen people that were last year paying maybe 10,000 pounds for a year and it's gone up to 50, 55,000 pounds a year just to heat their businesses um, and keep them running. And obviously, you know, that's not sustainable. Businesses will go under because of it. Um, there needs to be some kind of help. And this contest is making it very, very difficult um, to do that because obviously members deserve a say. Uh, they are paid up. That's part of the benefit of why they're, why mm -hmm. they're members. And of course, it's more democratic that the party rather than just the parliamentary party, the MPs, gets to choose who that person is. But of course, that does now leave us in a problem where we've got a six, eight, ten week le long leadership contest with very little in the way of policy um, that's actually able to alleviate the crisis. So how soon could this be re resolved? Well, so it finishes this week, actually. So um, the 3rd of September is the final day that Conservative members can vote. And then on Monday, uh, the 5th of September, we'll get the announcement of who the winner is going to be. Um, it's largely expected that it's going to be Liz Truss, who is the current Foreign Secretary. Um, and she is then expected to take office within a couple of days of that, probably on Wednesday the 7th. That sounds like it would be a tough situation to step into. It not, does, yeah. Not it a does. comfortable one. And she, no, exactly. And she's um, apparently she's going to announce an emergency budget with a load of new measures um, if, if and when she does take over. And so um, that will hopefully, you know, put an end to this this long period of inaction on actually getting support out there. But um, yeah, hopefully by about this time next week, at least the leadership contest element of the disaster will be over. All right, Callum, we are up against the clock here. I hope we yeah. get a chance to follow up. I want to see how this all turns out now. You yeah, got me you yeah, got me hooked. I want to know. <laughs> Where can people find yeah. you on social media? Yeah, so um, on Twitter, my handle is Peyton underscore Callum. So it's P-A-T-O-N underscore uh, C-A-L-U-M. It's that Scottish spelling. It's a bit, a bit different than you might expect. It. Yeah, that's where you can find me on Twitter and you'll, you'll see other articles that I've written and other things that I have to say on there. Welcome back. This is our fourth and final segment today on Moving Forward with Young Voices. And I'm happy to welcome our latest contributor, Kareem. Uh, help me with your last name. How do you say your last name, Kareem? Rafai. Rafai. Good to have you on board. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a pro-democracy activist based out of Metro Detroit, Michigan. I'm a senior at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, majoring in international security, communications, and Asian studies. All right. Now, I was looking at an article that you had written earlier about how repression is actually being exported by some countries in the world. And I don't want to sound cynical, but I basically I'm I'm not seeing a lot of countries where there isn't some form of repression for for the sake of those who are exporters though. What kind of countries are we talking about? Um countries like China, Russia, Iran, and it shouldn't be surprising to anyone who's familiar with these countries that they like to repress pro-democracy voices within their own borders. Uh, but the reason I wrote this article is it should ring a lot of alarm bells to anyone who's you know devoted to the cause of democracy or liberty that these regimes that usually spend their own time repressing their own people are now sending their agents to repress you know Western citizens uh, on our own soil in America and in the UK, Australia. Wow. Yeah, that's that's kind of. That's escalating, isn't it? Talk to me about about some of these actors. I know you give an example of, uh, is it Drew Pav Pavlu? Mm -hmm. tell, yes. me, tell me about um, his story. Yeah, so Drew Pavlu is an Australian human rights activist. 
Uh, he's been making waves for a couple of years now. Um, he famously at Wimbledon held up a sign that said, where is Peng Shui? Peng Shui was the tennis player who, uh, you know, made those sexual assault allegations and then disappeared for a couple of weeks. And the Chinese Communist Party tried to, you know, cover it up, et cetera. Um, so that was one of his kind of big um, kind of breaking stories. He was removed from Wimbledon for that. Um, and his most recent stint, he was protesting outside of the Chinese embassy in London um, with the Tibetan flag, the Uyghur flag, and I believe the Taiwanese flag, oh. um, you know, calling for their freedom, um, calling for the release of, you know, um, prisoners. And what happened was the Chinese embassy um, falsely claimed that he emailed them a bomb threat. Um, which obviously caused a lot of issues. The police were called. He was detained for almost 24 hours without access to a lawyer, um, without access to the consulate. Um, and this is like not the first time that he's been targeted by um, the Chinese embassy or the Chinese government. He had his email hacked by the Chinese government. Um, him and a lot of other activists um, in Australia specifically, that's what I was talking to him about, um, have routinely been targeted by smear campaigns by the Chinese Communist Party, hacking attempts, um, and it goes, the list goes on and on and on. And so I thought that I would talk to him because in America, we had two cases in New York within a week of um, Iran or um, people related to the regime um, under like doing an assassination attempt against um, a prominent human rights activist, Masih Helena Jad, and then a very, very, very prominent author, Salman Rushdie. So um, I sat down with uh, Drew over Zoom and we spoke from his uh, hotel room in London about the situation that's happening with, you know, the export of repression. Wow. I got to say, that's, uh, those are some very convincing examples and, and disturbing. Um, why would these regimes feel the need to exert their influence far beyond their own borders? I mean, are they are they laying claim to the consciousness of uh, other parts of the world as well? Right. That's a great question. And me and Drew talked about that in specific. And he told me, he said, think of the next, you know, 100,000 people that are thinking about speaking up against these regimes from the, you know, the safety of the West. Right. Um, think about them and think about them reading the news and seeing um, American citizens um, having their lives threatened by people abroad just for speaking out against a regime thousands of miles away. It's an intimidation tactic, not only for the human rights activists that are already speaking up, but to prevent more people in the West from also speaking up against these regimes and calling on lawmakers, uh, you know, to put sanctions or, you know, divest from a regime, et cetera. They're trying to silence any potential dissent, not within their own borders, but also abroad. Wow. Well, I I have to say that uh, this is, uh, I guess it, it's it's something that we, we should have ex expected. Um, I say that from the standpoint that you know you're having success when you start to get like serious opposition. So there's no doubt that these voices of these human rights activists were, were being heard. Otherwise, you know, they, they, they probably, um, you know, would, wouldn't have mattered at all to these governments. What is the danger of the West cozying up to some of these countries? Or is, I guess what I'm asking is, is it in our interest to, to go out and confront them? Or is there another way that this needs to be handled? Right. And this is also something that we discussed. And, you know, we're towing a fine line and it depends on the country, but something has to be done. And that's why I wrote this article, because we can't just keep sweeping these incidents under the rug. It's egregious that American citizens um, are having their lives threatened by actors from thousands of miles away simply for speaking. It's unbelievable, especially in a country where we pride ourselves on free speech and democracy, that we have activists that are, you know, frightened for their lives on our own soil. It's, it's not a matter of something that we can push under the rug anymore. It's ever present. It keeps happening and it needs to become a wedge issue when we're discussing diplomacy with these countries, when we're discussing trade with these countries, um, when we're discussing, you know, 
just regional influence in general, we can't keep ignoring these situations and pretending like it's not a present issue. And I think that's the frustration for a lot of human rights activists, especially um, Missy Helena Jad. She spoke to Fox News and told them, you know, the Biden administration needs to step up. They need to say something. They need to do something substantive and practical. They should deny a visa to Iran's president. Like this is egregious that, you know, and this is I'm paraphrasing her own words that, you know, she's feeling unsafe in New York City, um, you know, and this is not even the first attempt on her life. This is the second attempt in basically two years. There was a kidnapping plot against her last year as well. Wow. It's, it's just, yeah, I just can't even imagine from her standpoint. So uh, to answer your question um, in terms of confrontation, what confrontation looks like, you know, from Russia to China to Iran on this issue, it'll look different. Right. Mm -hmm. But it needs to become a point of discussion. It can't just be a, this is wrong and we stand against it. It has to become um, a hedge, like a wedge issue. Uh, you know, we're doing negotiation with your, Iran right now, right? We're, there's all this talk about the JCPOA being revived any hour, any day, right? So, you know, why are we not bringing up the fact that Iran is trying to kill people on our own soil when we're discussing, you know, peace negotiations or nuclear negotiations? Like this should be a point of contention. Yeah, there's well, and I think back to, uh, you know, when Trump took out General Soleimani, there's been bad blood for a long time between Iran and, and the U.S. I don't see that improving. It's been I mean, it's been decades. Unreal. Mm -hmm. Of who, course. In, in your opinion, Kareem, who who is the, the greater threat? And I'm not saying we need to see everybody as a threat, but if we're going to pay attention to a country out there that uh, that is likely to, to destabilize or otherwise um, negatively impact us, who sits at the top of that list, in, in your opinion? Um, I'd certainly say the long-term opponent is China, mm -hmm. for certain. Um, I think Russia, obviously, is another huge issue. But um, as the war in Ukraine kind of rages on, we'll see where Russia's positioning is afterwards. Um, in terms of threat um, for human rights activists in specific, it seems like um, Iran, especially and America, um, they kind of have the the drive to go ahead and do stuff like this. You know, they attack our soldiers in Syria. They attack our human rights activists uh, within our own borders. Everything is uh, it's a game of cat and mouse for them. Um, they're the ones that don't have that much to lose in comparison to you know china for example so you know as we're looking forward and we're figuring out how we're going to protect our activists moving forward i think a lot of attention needs to be paid to iran and you know their goals in destabilizing not only the middle east but also silencing voices within our own borders Man, I, I gotta say the recent unrest in the last couple of days in iraq has got to add a little the uh, little more tension to, to that whole situation as well. For certain, for certain. Kareem, where can people find you? Where where can they find you on social media? Where can they access your work? Um, I'm Kareem Rafai on Twitter and Instagram. That's K-A-R-E-E-M, like the basketball player. R-I-F as in Frank A-I. All right. Thanks so much for being our guest. I hope we talk again soon. Thank you so much. Oh, 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 oh,